Hi. Hi. So I'm, I'm uh, finding your name again here. Then I'm going to make you a co-host, and you can share your screen, and then I'll admit everybody. Sorry about this. This was. That's okay. <laughs> I had a nightmare that this is going to happen on Sunday. <laughs> <laughs> oh well. Like, where it happens. You go again now. How can huh? I? Uh, I have to make you a co-host. Yeah. <laughs> and there it is, right there. More make co-host. Okay, your co-host. You can be uh, share their screen at this point now, and okay. now I can and now I can go back up and admit everybody. Okay, so I'm just gonna get my slide ready if that's okay. Yes, so please do. You just see my title slide, right? I just see your face. Uh, I see your face. Yes, I see your title slide up in the corner, and your face enlarged. I think that's my view problem. If I okay, swap video and share screen there. Yes, so that yeah, I see you. Okay. Uh, admit. Okay, so we have everybody into the uh, from the uh, waiting room now. Okay, so sorry everybody for that delay. We had a problem of things being uh, doubly scheduled. Uh, I'm going to stop this with the recording and then start the recording over again. I think. Let's see. No, it is recording, so it's recording. It's fine. Um, and let's see. Do you want to? No. Let's see. Let's just cancel that. Okay. Uh, so, uh, sorry, a bit, bit flustered with the things going on. But anyway, uh, my pleasure to introduce uh, Katie Peterson, who is a graduate student at James Cook University uh, and is now a postdoc, uh, a fe postdoc fellow at CSYNC in, in Maryland. Um, and she's going to be talking about her paper that's uh, in press in conservation biology. It's uh, the title of it is listed here. But um, Doug Armstrong was the editor for this paper, and he was supposed to introduce uh, Katie, but couldn't be here, but wrote out a few points, and I, I, I like them quite a lot. So I'm going to go through them just to highlight the importance of this paper. So predicted impacts on ecosystems are one of the key issues that we consider in any kind of translocation problem. However, there's little research on this issue compared with other issues with uh, reintroduction biology. And so the need for this research is really uh, greatest with respect to assisted colonization and move, or moving things outside their current distributions. Proponents of assisted colonization emphasize uh, the risk and state that it will probably be essential to engage in assisted colonization in order to uh, prevent some species from going extinct in the face of climate change. Opponents point to the risk of undesirable ecosystem health in, uh, impacts from introducing species outside the range. The two camps mostly recognize the other perspective, but strongly disagree in priorities. So rational decisions about assisted colonization proposals require evaluating risk and assessing risk, and that this uh, should include theory for making quantitative predictions about ecosystem impact. Peter Senadal's paper provides a methodology for making a rapid and general predictions about the effects of these introductions uh, on a diversity of uh, recipient ecosystems, so it can make a valuable contribution to this decision-making process. So Katie, go ahead, take it away. All right, well, thank you all for being here. Uh, as Mark mentioned, I'm a current postdoc at Sysync, and today I'll be presenting some of my work from my PhD at JCU while I was a visiting scholar at QUT on using ensemble modeling to predict the impacts of assisted migration on recipient ecosystems. So first, I just wanna acknowledge my colleagues that have been directly involved in the work that I'm presenting today. Mike Bode was one of my PhD supervisors and my main collaborator in this work. The Applied Mathematical Ecology Group at QUT gave me some feedback while I was doing this research. And I'd especially like to point out Kylan and Chris, who are collaborators on a project that I'll discuss later in the talk. Megan, Leslie, Saul, and Colleen are also fantastic collaborators on that second project. And finally, I would like to acknowledge the Yagara people, the traditional owners of the land on which the Queensland University of Technology is situated, which is where I did most of this work. I'd also like to acknowledge the Chumash people, the traditional custodians of the land on which I'm speaking to you today. So the main content of my talk is on my paper with Mike on ensemble modeling, which was published this past June. I'll talk about what assisted migration is and why it's controversial, what ensemble modeling is and how we used it in this project, and I'll walk you through the different scenarios we modeled. I then want to present a little bit about an extension from this work using the same methods on an actual conservation project that's happening right now. 
we worked with the biologists in WA to model various management strategies for one of the largest refall nation projects to date. So many species face extinction as a consequence of habitat and environmental changes they can't escape. Assisted migration is a conservation initiative that moves a portion of a threatened population beyond its native range when species are unable to expand or shift the range on their own. Translocation is used to describe the action of moving individuals from their native population. Assisted migration is usually proposed as a way to prevent extinction due to the, due to the effects of climate change where species are sessile or there's some barrier preventing a shift to a more optimal thermal habitat. Assisted migration of the Edith's checker spot butterfly to prevent its extinction has been fiercely debated since the 90s. In 1996, Professor Camille Parmesan famously documented that the southern populations of the checker spot butterfly were extremely vulnerable to local extinction due to climate change. And some years after publishing this work, she advocated for the use of assisted migration to preserve some of these populations. The Kino subspecies is indigenous to Southern California and Northern Mexico, and its overall range has been diminished due to a suite of threats, including urban and agricultural development. Its remaining intact habitat is at risk of becoming unsuitable due to warming and drying from climate change. It has been unable to expand its range as it cannot navigate around the sprawling urban area of Los Angeles, and it would need human intervention to translocate the cocoons to suitable habitat north of LA. Advocates of assisted migration insist that this is the only way to save species like the Edith's checker spot butterfly that are unable to expand their range as climate change continues to worsen. Assisted migration has also been invoked to restore ecological functions and protect species from other threats. This is a burrowing betong, a macropod that is being translocated to an island refuge in Western Australia. This translocation will not only protect it from non-native predators like foxes and feral cats, but this betong will increase soil turnover in the island, which makes it easier for other species to create their own burrows. So assisted migration has been extremely controversial. It's been called ecological roulette as we have a history of moving species outside of their range for some purpose and those species subsequently wreak havoc on their new homes. This is well documented in the literature on invasive and pest species as well. Therefore, we have an ethical quandary. Do we save one species and potentially harm the species that are already present? We can consider ecological communities a network. Here, each blue node is a species and the lines represent pairwise interactions. Assisted migration has been pretty well studied in terms of what happens to the focal species uh, to be translocated, represented by the green node here. What's not well studied, however, is how the translocation affects the species that are already present. If we introduce a new species, do we destabilize that network of interactions? There are three general outcomes following assisted migration. In the best outcome, the species is translocated and becomes established and doesn't harm any other species. In a failed outcome, the species is translocated and it doesn't successfully establish in its new habitat, but it hasn't negatively affected other species to the extent that they become locally extinct. Although the translocated species may have failed to establish in its new home, it may have persisted in its native habitat. This depends on how threatened that species is and if removing individuals from the population in the native habitat negatively affects that population's chance of persisting. That depends on the native population's abundance, genetic fitness, and other factors. This is the worst outcome. After a species is translocated, it somehow impacts the recipient ecosystem to where at least one species becomes locally extinct, if not more. Given the possible outcomes, we wanted to see how often each of those occurred. We also wanted to see how many species were lost when things went really wrong after assisted migration. And then we wanted to see how these outcomes held in different contexts. The nodes and networks can be sensitive to network structure. And one element of network structure is the degree of connectance within that network. If species are more interconnected, there's a chance that the introduction of a new species will disrupt the other species directly and indirectly. 
So we had previous, like we evaluated those questions above in ecosystems that had been at stable equilibria because stable ecosystems are more likely to be chosen as candidates for assisted migration. Ideally, one wouldn't translocate a threatened species into an ecosystem that's going through an upheaval because that may affect its long-term success in the new habitat. However, this can always be helped and sometimes the only suitable habitat for translocation may not be in perfect equilibrium. So we looked at how the outcomes change when communities are subjected to a small to moderate but constant press impact like climate change and when an ecosystem network had recently been disrupted from a prior eradication, but hadn't reached equilibrium before the, tr the translocation. So we set up an ensemble of theoretical ecosystems to evaluate these. Ensemble modeling is essentially running the same general model over and over thousands and millions of times. It lets one change the model slightly through changes in the structure or parameter values and compare the outputs. The ecosystems we simulated were comprised of 15 coexisting interacting species using Lotka Volterra models, which is the equation shown here. The change in the abundance of species I through time T depends on the intrinsic growth rate and the abundance of that species. The intrinsic growth rates for each species were randomly chosen from a uniform distribution. The interaction matrix is comprised of elements X, which represent the per capita interaction strength of species J on individuals of species I. These per capita values combined with the abundances of species J and species I give the amount of interspecific competition from species J onto I and the amount of intraspecific competition within species I. We change the interaction matrices for each simulation by changing the degree of connectance between species and the magnitude of the interactions through random parameter values. To generate random levels of connectance, we use a Bernoulli random variable to decide if a species interacted or not. Where species did not interact, there is a zero in the interaction matrix. This let the degree of connectance vary across models in the ensemble. We then use an, another Bernoulli random variable to decide if the non-zero interactions were positive or negative. We fix the diagonals to always be negative to ensure density dependence from within species competition. We then use a uniform distribution to allocate the values of the parameters. These models were run to equilibria and any models where these 15 species did not coexist were discarded. It was difficult to find many models of 15 species with stable coexistence. So out of the millions of simulations we ran, we kept 100 ecosystems. Even though we did not parameterize the models to represent any particular ecosystem, by only keeping models with stable coexistence, this allowed us to throw out simulated ecosystems with extreme and ecologically impossible parameter combinations. Any models with growth rates that were too high or too low wouldn't have led to stable coexistence of this many species. So once 100 e recipient ecosystems with coexistence were found, we simulated assisted migration. A single randomly generated species, our translocated species, was added to each ecosystem and the response of the ecosystem was monitored for 100 time steps, in this case years. Did we end up with the base case, best case scenario with 16 species in the new ecosystem? We repeated this whole process 100 times for each of the coexisting 15 species ecosystems with a new random translocated species each time to get 10,000 simulated assisted migrations. What we found was that the best outcome where the translocated species became established but didn't negatively impact other species occurred 61% of the time. Failed translocations occurred 17% of the time and the worst outcome occurred 22% of the time. Using the results from our ensemble model and a risk analysis, we calculated the average total richness when assisted migration was not chosen and when it is. This graph shows the probability of the translocated species in green persisting in its native habitat, which is 50% because in our models, it's critically endangered. 
The persistence of the species increases to 90% when you included translocated species that successfully established in the recipient ecosystem. This left about 10% chance that the translocated species would not persist in any outcome um, when assisted migration is or isn't chosen. In blue, this is a distribution of the possible numbers of species within the recipient community persisting. There are 15 species in the recipient community about 80% of the time, which includes the best and failed outcomes where the recipient ecosystem was unaffected. When the recipient ecosystem is affected, there's a rare but still possible chance of losing multiple species within the recipient ecosystem, bringing the species richness down to 10 species all the way down to seven species in some very rare cases. So if one does not proceed with assisted migration, the total richness is 15.5 species. The 0.5 for the 50% chance that the would-be translocated species survives on its own in its native habitat, and the fact that the recipient ecosystem would be thus unaffected. If you do proceed with assisted migration, total richness is slightly lower with an average of 15.4 species from our model outcomes. In the best outcome, you have 16 total species, including the 15 in the recipient ecosystem and the translocated species. Um, but this is offset by the instances where multiple species in the recipient ecosystem is lost, bringing that average down to 15.4. So in our baseline scenario, the density of interactions varied across models. We also modeled scenarios with three separate and specific levels of density, network density to determine if our results were sensitive. I have two of those here. The low density network allowed for 25% of the interactions to be non-zero. The medium density network had non-zero values for 50% of the interactions. And the high density network had non-zero values for 75% of the interactions. The results were the same if you don't proceed with assisted migration. But if you do proceed with assisted migration, the overall richness is worse, especially with models with moderate or high density of interactions. So when ecosystems aren't at stable e equilibria, we have to take that into account as well. The Torreya guardians have been passionately advocating for the assisted migration of the Torreya pine because it's threatened by climate change. But the locations where it would be translocated into are also being affected by climate change to varying extents. We extended our model to see how a press impact like climate change affects outcomes. The impacts from climate change on ecosystems are more complicated than what we modeled, but we wanted to keep it very general. In our models, the recipient ecosystem was subjected to an incremental annual change of 1% to the growth rates and interactions between species. This incremental change was randomly chosen as positive or negative for each parameter and for each species, but the sign was held the same throughout time to represent that climate change may have differential effects among species. After translocation, all species, included the translocated species, were subjected to this incremental impact. So the bar graphs are a little different here. The green shows the frequency of different levels of species richness when assisted migration is not chosen. And the blue represents the frequency of different levels of species richness when one, one, when one does proceed with assisted migration. This includes both the recipient ecosystem and the translocated species. So the overall species richness is higher when assisted migration is not carried out. But um, here we have the results where the target species is critically endangered, like in our previous scenarios. The average richness is nearly the same following either decision. But when assisted migration is chosen, the high rate of establishment of the target species offsets the loss of multiple species in the ecosystem. When assisted migration is not chosen, there is a high frequency of 15 total species, but a low rate of successful establishment of the target species. And you get an infrequent loss of one or two species in the recipient ecosystem due to climate change. So depending on how important the target species is, this may be a case where you want to proceed with assisted migration, 
since on average, the species richness is nearly the same following either decision. However, the difference in the average richness following either decision is greater if the target species is listed as vulnerable. Vulnerable species have a 10% chance of going extinct in its native habitat over the next 100 years, rather than 50%. When assisted migration is not chosen, the target species still fares well in its native habitat, which offsets a few instances where the recipient ecosystem loses species due to climate change. So the difference in the overall richness between the options is affected by the conservation status to, of the species to be translocated. And in our simulated approximations of climate change, assisted migration affects the recipient ecosystem more. But to stress again, our simulation of climate change is a very much an approximation of what actually happens. Finally, the last scenario we modeled is where a prior species within the recipient ecosystem had been eradicated, which is often the case in restoration projects. New Zealand, for example, has a long and successful history of eradicating non-native mammals on islands, followed by subsequent translocations. Most taxa that have been reintroduced or translocated to the islands are birds, like the yellowhead or kiwi. We randomly removed a species from the ecosystem after the 15 species had reached equilibrium and then modeled a translocation 10 years after the removal before the recipient ecosystem could re-equilibrate. The highest possible richness for this scenario is 15 species. If the target species is critically endangered, it's better to follow through with assisted migration because the recipient ecosystem dynamics are already disrupted and the risk of further harming those species is offset by the chance to drastically improve the odds of persistence of the target species. If the target species is only vulnerable though, the species richness is about the same following either option. The high probability that it'll persist in the native habitat offsets some of the lost species in the recipient ecosystem due to the disrupted dynamics. So to sum up, assisted migration is risky and in an unparameterized system where the only concern is species richness, assisted migration generally causes more harm than good. The outcomes will vary based on the attributes of both the recipient ecosystem and the translocated species. We did not explicitly model trophic dynamics or specify interaction type, which would impact the outcomes. We used a very simple utility function in our analysis where we assigned equal weight to the translocated species and to each species in the recipient ecosystem. This is not realistic for a real project because presumably if you're translocating a species that has higher importance than some other species. Also, um, we considered something a negative outcome when species went extinct. In some circumstances, a small change in the population size of a species without extinction may be considered a negative outcome. Therefore, it's important to consider the conservation status as well as the roles and functions of all species within the recipient ecosystem and the translocated species. Assisted migration is a viable conservation in intervention but the risks would have to be offset by either reducing the impact of the translocated species on the recipient ecosystem or ensuring that the translocated species persists even if it becomes extinct in its native habitat. So as I mentioned earlier, we took the ensemble modeling framework and extended it to a real conservation project. Dirk Hartog Island is located in the Shark Bay World Heritage Area off the coast of Western Australia. As I mentioned at the beginning, it's one of the largest refaunation projects to date. And the goal is to restore the island's ecosystem to how it was before European settlement. Dirk Hartog landed on the island in 1616, hence the name Return to 1616. Goats, sheep, and feral cats had to be eradicated off of the island and 13 total native animals which includes some mammals, marsupials, and a bird are being translocated to the island at different times. They've only translocated a few of these species so far, and one of the first was a 
banded hair wallaby pictured here. These 13 species were thought to be present on the island before human interference. Goats and sheep impacted the vegetation, reducing the food source for many of these species. Feral cats were effective predators of the rodents and small mammals, and they also competed with the carnivorous mammals. Because these 13 species would be translocated within a short time frame, before 2030, we needed to see if priority effects would change the overall outcomes. Usually translocations of multiple species are spaced out by a decent amount of time, and most projects only move a few species. 13 different species in this short of a time span is unprecedented. We also wanted to see if some species were more sensitive to, than others to particular reintroduction strategies. Was there one strategy that worked for all species equally well? Or were there any species that did poorly no matter what? Though the 13 species were thought to have coexisted on Dirk Hartog Island before European settlement, they've not been directly observed together. Since they're a novel assemblage, there's a lot of uncertainty in how the species will interact. So I just wanna mention that this work isn't published yet, hence the no tweeting logo in the corner. Anyway, we worked directly with the biologists at DPAW to incorporate data into a model ensemble. Three biologists gave us a total of six sign structured interaction matrices that they made independently and a consensus matrix they developed after discussing together the possible interactions in detail. These matrices represent different dynamics that may occur when the species have all been translocated to the island. They're the aggregate of a, of a variety of interactions like predation, competition for food or habitat, and some facilitative interactions. These included the interactions between the 13 key species and interactions with functional groups that represent species already on the island, like vegetation, other rodents, predatory birds, and varanids, which can be prey for some of the translocated species and predators of others. We generated hundreds of thousands of interaction matrices with random parameter values with the appropriate sign and matrix structure. The reintroduction strategies given by the experts were 23 different scenarios that specified where and when each species would be translocated onto the island. Generally, the locations were fairly consistent due to habitat preferences of the species, but timing and order differed. The locations of the translocations and the dispersal data from the experts informed the spatial component of the model. Species had different dispersal rates and there was a time lag for most species before they started dispersing. We used certain criteria to discard models that were ecologically unviable, which we called model filters. These included the coexistence of subsets of these species due to their co-occurrence on islands, other islands, and within the fossil record. We also used the upper and lower bounds of growth rates for the species as another filter. Models where any species reproduced outside of this range of feasible and biologically realistic growth rate values were discarded. So we followed a similar methodology as the assisted migration paper, but this was parameterized for the system as closely as possible, given the amount of uncertainty within the system. So here we have the aggregate results from the consensus sign structured matrix, which was the one that the biologists made together for all species across the 23 different reintroduction strategies. The black dot in the violin plots is the average number of species lost by 2060, roughly 30 years after the last translocation. Option six is slightly worse than some of the other reintroduction strategies. And this option is where the Burring Betong was not translocated. This is probably because a few of the interaction matrices emphasize the Betong's eco-engineer role, where it makes it easier for other species to make burrows by increasing soil turnover. By not translocating it, that function is lost, as well as the positive impacts on some of the other species. For all of the reintroduction strategies, there's a small, chance of losing multiple species. The tails of the violin plots extend to about fail, four failed translocations. 
This heat map takes those same results, but it separates it out by species. The gray is where failed translocations are effectively zero. The warmer colors represent a higher instance of failed translocations. The outcomes are fairly consistent across the reintroduction strategy for most species. On the far left, the dibbler doesn't do very well no matter what reintroduction strategy is chosen, hence its yellow response. There's a fair amount of variability, however, with how the heath mouse fares after the reintroduction strategies. So this heat map takes the species specific responses to the reintroduction strategies and breaks it down by the sign structured matrices made by the biologists. This is only for a subset of the species to show the different kinds of outcomes. We have 13 of these. By separating the results out by the interaction matrix, we can see that some species are more sensitive to certain reintroduction strategies, depending on what dynamics are thought to be occurring. In this previous heat map, we saw how the Dibbler responded um, to the different reintroduction strategies when only considering the consensus matrix, which is the yellow column on the right of this plot. The Dibbler does marginally better if you consider other sign structured matrices, and in some it does really well where the gray bars are. Other species, especially the Chudich, seem to do well no matter what. They are completely insensitive to the dynamics and the reintroduction strategies. The other species vary a bit in how they respond to different management strategies, but this depends on what the presumed interactions are. And then we have the heath mouse again, which doesn't really have any consistency in the results across reintroduction strategies and interaction matrices. So in both, both examples, even though we used very simple models, differences in the model structure through the interaction matrices and differences in the parameter values yielded quite a bit of variability in the results. This underscores the importance of getting the model structure as accurate as possible within reason. Accuracy and parameter values is also helpful but without having data from mesocosm experiments where interactions can be meticulously observed, parameter values for interactions between species are rough estimates at best. In attempting to represent any complex ecosystem with models, there will always be significant amounts of uncertainty. It's not feasible to include every bio biological and ecologically relevant parameter and value to each individual species. Using ensemble modeling with relatively simple models allows one to capture the necessary dynamics and allows for flexibility in parameter values while evaluating multiple scenarios. Even better, the model ensemble can be updated with more information as the data are gathered to further constrain outputs. This can facilitate adaptive management and conservation decision-making by taking some some management options off the table and allowing for the evaluation of newly developed management options. Finally, this method helps us quantitatively evaluate the aggregate and species specific responses to different conservation initiatives. This allows us consi to consider if outcomes and risks are worth saving a particular species using quantitative predictions and not just discussing this qualitatively. So thank you for your time today. The first paper I discussed is published in Conservation Biology and the other will hopefully be in review soon. Okay, hey, great, thanks Katie. Um, as I forgot to mention at the outset that uh, if you want questions to ask, just go ahead and type them in the chat box. And I think, well, actually I don't know whether I have to unmute, allow you to unmute or if you can I think uh, you can unmute yourselves if you would like to ask a question. I will go ahead and ask a first question while people are getting ready to ask questions. So I think I saw in one of your, that was a great talk, by the way. Thank, Thank you. you. Uh, um, I saw in one of your graphs that you had a, a sort of an abundance measure on the side and, and watching populations collapse, and which implies that you could calculate an evenness measure for your 15 species that are uh, that are in there. 
And I'm wondering if it would be informative, or if you think it would be informative, if you were to look at changes in evenness um, uh, through time, through the assisted migration event. So uh, you mentioned that uh, you were looking for things to go to extinction, but they could go down to low abundance. And so it would be a very different thing if uh, you introduced a species and it became dominant and everything else became very rare, or if it became a moderate component of those ecosystems. I wonder if you could just address that. Yeah, so there are a bunch of scenarios and extensions that could be using that same framework. And actually in our paper, um, I didn't go through all of the scenarios and results that we had. We had some circumstances where we modeled um, scenarios that were not ideal for assisted migration. And that includes um, a vulnerable species and one in which if the population decreases to a certain threshold, but it's not extinct, you would consider that a negative outcome. Um, and I mean, that is a way to sort of filter and check the results. Um, if you're not okay with the species going extinct, if like even a marginal change in population, but you're right, um, taking those abundances and doing an evenness measure would be really great. Um, there are also different um, extensions that could be done, like looking at trophic structure and how that affects things. And like if the composition of species changes, so you have more predators or more herbivores and whatnot. Um, if the functional role of species shifts after assisted migration. Um, yeah, there are a lot of extensions that can be done with this work. So. Thank you. So we have a question in from Suzanne Hillcoat. Uh, by the way, uh, I didn't introduce myself. I'm Mark Schwartz. I'm from UC Davis. I'm not Miriam Hernandez. We're just using that. <laughs> um, so the question from Suzanne says, fantastic talk, Katie. Do you know when the DEPAW, uh, D-P-A-W, is planning on beginning the species introductions of Dirk Hartog Island? Would love to follow this project. Yeah, so they actually have started this already. The website has lots of information and they've been updating it pretty regularly. So they've introdu introduced, um, I think four at this point, maybe more species. I'll have to double check that. Um, so when we modeled this, they had only introduced, um, they had done two rounds of introductions. And so they reintroduced the banded hair wallabies and the dibblers, and they introduced the rufous hair wallaby as well. Um, and so they're in the process of introducing these species. And we constrained our models to include that the species that they already translocated were persisting and coexisting on the island. Um, that was one of the model filters that we had. But yeah, they, um, they've been doing the project um, and it's been getting a lot of press in Australian news actually. Um, there's quite a few write-ups on it. And they started doing the eradications of the goats and sheep and feral cats, I think in the early 2000s. And the introductions have been going on maybe two years or so. Um, but yeah, they're trying to get it all done by 2030. So um, there's a lot of information available. Um, so it should be pretty easy to follow the project as it proceeds. OK, Resit would like to ask a question in person. And I think the answer to that is yes. Oh, there you are. You can unmute yourself. Go ahead. Yeah. Um, hi. Um, great talk. Thank you. Um, so, you in the simulations you did, in which you took one of the species out, and then after ten years you introduce a new species. How did you select the interaction parameters of the new species? Uh, were they completely random, or were they random but related to the one that was taken out? They were completely random. Not they did not fill so like they didn't fill the niche of the species that was removed. So, so it was just completely random. Yeah, you can imagine that if people decided which species to move based on the characteristics and interactions of the species that went extinct, it would be a lot more um, conducive to to the stability of the the total fifteen species system. Yeah, absolutely. And that would be really great to model. Um, so 
Yeah, you could remove a species and then introduce a species that fills a similar role and has the same sort of interactions with those species that are already present. But then in a lot of um, restoration projects like the ones in New Zealand, they're removing mammals and they're introducing birds or they're removing rodents and they're introducing birds or other native mammals. And so that wouldn't necessarily be emulating um, that. Yeah, so. obviously. Um, if I may, I, I'll have another quick question. Absolutely. Um, so in the, in the initial simulation where um, all the, of course, um, introductions are resulting in one or two or three or even more species going extinct, um, is there a way to, um, I don't know how to say, that, to, to generalize the characteristics of the systems that lead to more extinctions? So you gave one example that uh, if, if the number of the interaction density is in the middle, it's less, but more um, damage occurs if it is 25% or 75%. But are there any other generalizations that you can make from that so that we can have, I don't know, like rules of thumb about what what constitutes a safer ecosystem to, to translocate species into? Yeah, so you could take um, the results and look at the abundances of the relative species when a translocation um, causes that ripple effect of loss of species. You could look at the magnitudes of the interactions in the networks. You could look at the direction, like are they mostly negative? Are there um, zero positive interactions at all? Um, there's a lot of things that you could look at. We didn't do that. We were just trying to um, get a general idea. Um, it would be really cool if someone did do that. Um, but my colleague Kylan, who was involved in the Dirk Hartog Island project, he kind of did that. Um, so we were interested to see um, why certain species did poorly, um, like when their introduction failed, what caused that? And he devised a sort of way to look at um, are the interactions, um, what are the interactions like when like the Dibbler fails in those model outcomes? Um, is it because it has stronger than normal interactions with native predators? Um, does it have stronger than normal interactions with other rodents? Um, even though Dibbler is not technically a rodent, it's a small mammal. Um, so he actually did that. I didn't present on that because that was not um, my part of the project. Um, but when that paper comes out, I can send it to you. Um, but yeah, great question. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Great, great talk. Yeah, thank you. Hey, so uh, Katie, would you want to uh, unshare your screen and maybe we can ask people to put their faces up on the screen and, and uh, people, so you can see who you were talking to? Uh, uh, Nicola Mitchell has a question that she'd like to ask in person and she's up next. Okay. Hi, Katie. Um, I'm in Perth, WA, so it's pretty early over here. That was yeah. really relevant to lots of things we're doing. Today. Um, I just wanted to ask about how the decision about the, or the, the weight of um, value of assisted colonisation might change if the source of the um, focal species is a captive breeding um, colony versus taking from the wild. Yeah, so... I would love to talk on that. Um, so in our models, we assumed that when you take a portion of that population, you didn't impact the source population at all. And that would be analogous to taking individuals from a captive bred situation. Okay. Um, so um, we have a risk assessment that's in the paper and that includes um, a factor of damage to the source population. So if the population size is really low and you take a portion of that, um, yeah. then that would be factored into the risk analysis. So, yeah. yeah. Okay. And I've also got a question about the Dirk Hartog work, um, which I'm sort of involved with as well. So when, how did you actually factor in things like founder size and, and those sorts of issues that might, you know, you know it's genetic and um, demographic issues around the source of the, or the size of the introduced population in terms of whether it was successful? Yeah, so um, that at effect we didn't account for in the models because the biologists have kind of strict um, constraints on 
how many individuals they can move to the island. Um, so basically each species is being moved um, in the spring and the fall. And there's about 30 individuals for each of these translocations. Um, and so we have these separate discre discrete translocation events taken into account in the model as well as abundances. So we didn't uh, allow for flexibility or modify that in the model, but that's definitely someone could, definitely something someone could look at for their own project. Yeah, we're modeling the Dibbler right now. And I think okay. and that was one of the species that's having trouble establishing, I think, because of the small population, small numbers that were released. Yeah, thanks. Yeah. Oh, no uh, thanks. So, so there's nobody else in the with a question in the waiting room. So I will uh, throw up another question and encourage people to put up questions. But so I, I understand that you could uh, sort of uh, spend the rest of your life manipulating variables in a, in a model like you did for this paper. And so you want to constrain this, but a couple of things occurred to me that uh, about the test now. is that there was a relatively small differences between the using assisted migration or not using assisted migration outcomes. And you might, and I might be interesting to see, to poke the system to see where you would get bigger differences. For example, when you have a criteria of getting a hundred communities that have stability to begin with, you're starting with something akin to an equilibrium community. And a lot of communities aren't equilibrium communities. And so if you find ones that, that lose some species over a certain amount of time that are near equilibrium species, would you get a different outcome? I also thought um, a lot of people would suggest that maybe climate change would impact demographic rates by more than 0.1. And as a consequence, maybe 0 0.3 or 0 0.4. And so you start ramping that up and you might start to get bigger differences in uh, the effect of assisted migration on the community size. And do you have any insights on that or thoughts? Yeah, so um, as I mentioned, everything that we had was pretty simple. Um, climate change is not always just a small 10% increase or decrease in certain demographic rates or parameter values. Um, we didn't take into account variability in climate effects, um, which is very important. Um, yeah, there's a lot of extensions that can be done with this work. Um, I think something that would be interesting going to your first point about looking at um, why we get certain outcomes, like um, where you lose so many species in the recipient outcomes, does that have, do those models have certain attributes? Um, can you sort of compartmentalize them and then evaluate like, what is different about this one? Um, like I said, is it because they're really strong interactions? Is it because they have um, high density networks? Um, and so by just aggregating it and um, letting our variables be pretty random and looking at this large suite, we get a general idea, but um, tuning it into like more fine scaled scenarios would definitely lead to those kinds of insights. Great, thank you. That's that's good. Other, we have just a few minutes to try and uh, uh, any ask any more questions. If anyone's out there with a with a burning question, otherwise we'll wrap it up and thank Katie again and go on about our days. Uh, if it's uh, for Nicola and others that are very early in Australia or some of the rest of us who are reaching the end of our days. Katie, you're in the Eastern time zone, so it's- uh, I'm actually in California, so it's Ooh, um, it's 2.53 <laughs> here, it's perfect. All right, yeah, here too. Where in California are you? I'm in San Luis Obispo. Okay, yeah. Yeah, right. it's where my family's based, so. All right, good. Yeah. Okay, I'm not seeing any more questions, so I think we can just uh, thank you once again and, uh, uh, and call it a, a, a wrap. So I'm gonna stop the recording so we can post this up afterwards. And uh, there's some comments coming in saying,